In the second part of the video, we're going to look at, uh, first of all, how we can use calculus to manipulate both sides of one of these equations that we have that relates a function to its uh, power series. And then we'll see two applications to calculus for how using a, a Taylor polynomial or a Taylor series actually allows us to answer questions that we could well, we either couldn't answer before or we had to answer in a different way before. All right, so first of all, for the manipulation part, uh, we'll continue with the example with the geometric series. And remember, what we're saying with the geometric series is that uh, if you take 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed and so on, you'll get 1 over 1 minus z. And that's true <coughs> as long as z is between negative 1 and 1. And again, that comes from the geometric series formula. Um, <coughs> this left-hand side you can just think of as a geometric series uh, with common ratio z. <coughs> so in that series, I'm um, sorry, in this uh, equation that I have, if I make this substitution, change the z into negative x squared, then I'll have uh, 1 plus negative x squared, and I'm going to just include gratuitous parentheses here for a second just to make sure it's clear. Oops. x squared squared, x squared cubed, and so on. <clears throat> and then on the right-hand side, it'll be 1 over 1 minus negative x squared. So I've changed the z's to be minus x squared, and I've carried parentheses with that so that I'm sure that, um, that I'm doing the substitution correctly. Uh, now, each of those powers can be resolved. I know things like when I do x squared cubed, that's really x to the sixth, and x squared squared is really x to the fourth. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that um, the negative that's inside the parentheses is going to persist as a negative when I'm raising to an odd power, and it's going to become positive when I raise to an even power. And so the net result of that is that the series up here on the left, sorry, up here on the left, can be rewritten this way. So it becomes very simple. I have 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth minus x to the sixth, and so on. So I just have even powers of x, and they alternate uh, adding and subtracting. On the other side, I have this part from my substitution, 1 over 1 minus negative x squared. And of course, that's the same as 1 over 1 plus x squared. So you might see where I'm going with this now. Um, that's a legitimate substitution on both sides, like I said before in the last video. But now, uh, let's take both sides of this equation, the function equal to the power series, and let's integrate that from 0 to z. And z is just a made-up variable here to be a different variable from x, just so we don't confuse the two. So on the uh, left-hand side, if I integrate 1 over 1 plus x squared, uh, that's the arctangent. So I'll have arctangent of x evaluated from 0 to z, which will just be arctangent of z, since arctangent of 0 is 0. So on the left-hand side, I have arctangent of z. On the right-hand side, uh, I'm simply taking the antiderivative of each of these uh, powers of x, which is a simple thing to do. Uh, antiderivative of 1 is x. Antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x cubed. And then 1 fifth x to the fifth. Notice the signs are alternating. <coughs> And be, just like uh, we had the, um, <clears throat> we said before that the original polynomial was just the even powers of x alternating sign, and so now we'll have just the odd powers, but we have those factors that come out of the antiderivative formula. So that gets evaluated. Um, again, that's, oops, this is my antiderivative evaluated from 0 to z. Um, when you put 0 in for x, in this in the power series, uh, you're just going to get zero. Every term there is zero, <clears throat> so zero minus zero plus zero minus zero, and so on. And so the uh, all that you're going to have left then is what you get by putting z in for x. And so. What I've done then is I have derived uh, the power series representation for arctangent of z without, without having to do the uh, table approach that we did for Taylor polynomials. I didn't have to take the arctangent and take its first derivative, second derivative, and third derivative, and so on. Um, instead, I can manipulate 
uh, formulas that I already know until it tells me something about the, what the series for our tangent would be. A uh, good question here is, what's the radius of convergence or the interval of convergence for this? Um, that is on the solution sheet that goes with this handout that you can look at. But um, if you have been reviewing section 9.2, then uh, this is a good one to, um, to practice on. The hint is it, ha it should have something to do with this starting point. This is what we started with with our original formula. And so it can't be that the z's we have down here somehow get outside of that range. But, uh, but the question is, is that, is that exactly the same um, interval of convergence for this new series, or is it a little bit different? All right, um, so lastly, I want to show how to solve two calculus problems uh, <coughs> where we can use this idea of series approximation um, as an alternative to other ways that we have to do it. So for example, um, in this problem, um, there's a typo here that should be log of x plus 1. I will, <clears throat> I'll fix that on this handout before I <clears throat> post it. Um, so we can use our uh, table approach. So if you remember, the uh, process we used was to think about our zeroth, first, and second derivatives. Here I'm trying to do the second degree approximation. Um, we want to write down what our formula is and then how to evaluate it at zero. Going to, the center of this approximation is going to be at zero. One way I know I need to do that is um, <clears throat> if you look here, the limit here is x goes to zero. So a polynomial approximation at, centered at zero is going to be an infinitely good approximation or a, a better and better approximation and the closer and closer you get to, to zero. And that's exactly what's happening in a limit problem. When you say the limit is x goes to zero, you mean let x get as close as you'd like to zero. And so the uh, so polynomial approximations will actually be um, considered to be the same as the original function as x gets closer and closer to zero. So um, what I'll have here, I'm not going to write the formula down, but I'll have uh, 0, 1, and negative 1 are the values of those derivatives. And so that means the polynomial approximation <clears throat> is going to be x minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. So you can check that, but that'll be the polynomial approximation um, centered at zero. So the idea here is that this is um, approximately this, oh sorry, that's a squared, approximately the same as log of x plus one. And when I say approximately, I mean, I'll say approximately as x is approximately zero. And what I mean by that is that the closer x gets to zero, the more log of x plus one looks like x minus a half x squared. So that all allows us to do this trick, which is these are not algebraically equal, but they're going to be equal in the limit because the limit is letting x get arbitrarily close to zero. So uh, in the limit, I can replace the log of x plus one with its polynomial approximation. So what's happened here is that the log of the log of x plus one has been replaced with its polynomial approximation. And those are not equal to each other, but the limit of log of x plus one as x goes to zero should be the same as the limit um, of the polynomial as x goes to zero. The advantage of the polynomial, of course, is that I have algebra I can apply now that I didn't have before. So in my numerator, uh, x minus a half x squared minus x, the x's are going to cancel. And I'll have just minus one half x squared divided by x squared. And it's easy to see that that is just negative one half. So that's the answer to the limit problem. You can try that with L'Hopital's rule as well, and you'll see that um, not only do you get the same thing, but it'll be very suspicious that you're getting the same thing for kind of the same reason. And, uh, and that's not a coincidence, of course. Uh, one could prove L'Hopital's rule by using these polynomial approximations if you wanted to. Um, 
And then in example D, finally, um, we're talking about doing an antiderivative. The one that's here is significant because this is an example of an antiderivative problem that does not have an elementary answer. Um, and so uh, this is a time where writing the problem in terms of series actually allows us to get an answer where, um, where we would not be able to get one otherwise. So, um, so what I'm going to do here is instead of integrating e to the minus x squared, I'm going to integrate a, a series approximation to e to the minus x squared. To get that, I'm going to do just a couple of steps. I'm going to first write down my, my uh, uh, Taylor series that I know from the previous piece of paper for e to the z. And I know it says here to just use the first four terms. That's just to keep it kind of contained. But I'll give you an idea of what's happening in general. Um, that's the polynomial, the infinite polynomial that represents e to the z. So each of those fractions is just 1 over uh, k factorial, where the, um, the coefficient is on the z to the k term. And then I can just substitute um, negative x squared for z, just like I did in the problem with arctangent. So that'll give me 1 minus x squared plus 1 half of negative x squared squared plus 1 sixth of negative x squared cubed plus 1 24th negative x squared to the fourth and so on. And so instead of integrating e to the minus x squared, I'm going to be integrating that infinite polynomial. Again, notice that the negative uh, number, the negative sign inside of the power um, will resolve itself to either be a plus or a minus, depending on whether the power is even or odd. So that's what I'd be integrating, and I can simply just integrate term by term. So the antiderivative of x is 1, antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x cubed, And so it goes, and of course, since it's an a indefinite integral, technically there's a plus c on there. It's a little weird because we usually write it at the end, but it seems weird after all the dot, dot, dots. So some people would write the plus c up there at the beginning. But that's what it would look like. Um, so we have a power series representation, and we could write out as many terms of that as we wanted to. Uh, but a power series representation for the antiderivative e to the minus x squared, even though there is no combination of elementary functions that has exactly that power series. Um, but knowing a power series representation allows us to get approximate answers to within the amount of tolerance that we want. And so in a lot of ways, this answer is just as good as any other answer, um, even though traditionally we don't have a way of getting the, the problem. I mean, we don't have a way of getting the answer as a combination of of our normal uh, logs and e's and signs. So um, your assignment is to try uh, two problems. One's just like example C and one's just like example D. Um, and you can follow along with this video and try writing them up and you'll submit a photo of your, of your work um, in D2L.